Right, so we are going to take a look today at uh, some consequences of the Boltzmann transport equation. If you recall, we made one fundamental assumption in writing the Boltzmann equation down and that was the assumption of molecular chaos. In other words, we assumed that in a cell in mu space, in single particle phase space, the probability that you have a particle at the position r with a velocity v at time t with some velocity v1 at some time t simultaneously with the probability that you have uh, another particle in the same cell with a different velocity v2 was simply the product of the densities. So this was v multiplied by the corresponding volume elements in mu space d mu1 and d mu2. So this was the assumption of molecular chaos. Assumption. That together with binary collisions led to the Boltzmann equation, the transport equation. So this plus binary collisions elastic collisions in which you did not lose a particle, nothing got absorbed. This led to the Boltzmann equation. Boltzmann transport equation. In kinetic theory, it is usual to call the Boltzmann equation the Boltzmann transport equation because as we will see very briefly today, you can extract transport coefficients from the Boltzmann equation such as the diffusion coefficient, the coefficient of thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity and so on, viscosity, etc. So they can all be computed for whatever system you are looking at, in this case a dilute gas from the Boltzmann equation with a very systematic procedure. Okay. The catch was that the Boltzmann equation was a nonlinear integral differential equation in this function f. So that is what made it practically impossible to solve analytically and then there is a huge literature which over the last uh, 100 plus years has been devoted to trying to develop systematic approximation procedures for going further and further with towards the exact solution of the Boltzmann equation. Okay. Now we are going to look at a very, very, very oversimplified version of it today very briefly. But I would like to go over again, since it is so important to the foundations of statistical physics, I would like to go over again uh, some of the key steps that we went through in deriving the Boltzmann equation. I am not going to give the derivation again, I am just going to call attention to what are the features of this equation. So if you recall, the equation itself said that uh, delta F over delta T for a particle with velocity v1, say some arbitrary velocity v1. So by f, I mean f of r, v1 and t plus v1 dot del in position space del r times this f plus if you had an external force of some kind, then that force f over m dot gradient in velocity space on f. This is a differential operator acting on the V dependence of f. This was equal to the famous collision integral which is delta f over delta t. I use delta f over delta t just to define this collision integral here through this equation here. This has got the dimensions of f divided by time, which is why I call it this, but very often in textbooks you would see it is called the collision integral and that is it and a separate symbol is used for it altogether. And this collision integral under the assumption of binary collisions, that was equal to this equal thing here was equal to an integral d3 v2 for our scattering geometry, integral d sigma is dependent on omega and now let me explicitly write its dependence also on the relative velocity, the magnitude of the relative velocity u times u times f, we had a strange notation, f2 prime 
f1 prime minus f2 f1 in standard notation where the scattering geometry just to recall to you once again was v1 and v2 coming in the initial states and then going out with velocities v1 prime and v2 prime and for instance f2 prime was identically f of r v2 prime t etc. So the four velocities involved in the collision v1, v2, v3 and uh, OAS and of course this quantity u was mod v2 minus v1 which is also equal to mod v2 prime minus v1 prime. <coughs> the scattering cross section is dependent on where you are looking with respect to the incident direction v1 and this quantity here u which is the relative velocity. Okay. So this equation as we can see here is a nonlinear different integral differential equation for this unknown function f that is what creates the problem. Okay. Of course we know that certain quantities are conserved in this collision. We know that the total momentum of the system is conserved. We know that uh, the total energy kinetic energy is conserved and those will have to be put in. We also know that the total particle number is conserved. So no particles are going out anywhere in this gas. They are all in there. So at any given time if you integrate this f the normalization was integral d3 r integral d3 v which is what I call d mu in mu space. This multiplied by f of r v t at any given time this is equal to the number density, okay, the number of particles per unit volume. Now this f has two interchangeable meanings in under the assumptions we have made large numbers and so on. The f multiplied by the volume element in phase space is either the total number of particles in that per unit volume in that space or it is also the probability that a given particle has the position r in the cell whatever is concerned the, the center at the point r with a velocity v at time t. Okay. These two are interchangeably used. Okay. Now this equation is satisfied by those f's for which the assumption for those states of the gas for which the assumption of molecular chaos is valid. It is not saying that this assumption is valid at all times. It is not saying that at all. It is just saying if the gas instantaneously happens to be a state in a state in which this assumption is valid, then the gas obeys the Boltzmann equation. Okay. And we found out that Boltzmann introduced and he proved this uh, necessary and sufficient condition for equilibrium by a very ingenious argument he introduced the h function and we discovered that dh over dt was not positive, was either equal to 0 or less than 0 at any given time. What it actually means is that if at some instant of time the gas obeys the Boltzmann equation and obeys therefore the assumption of molecular chaos, then an infinitesimal instant later, so if at time t it obeys the equation, there is molecular chaos, then at t plus epsilon where epsilon goes to 0 from the positive side, you are guaranteed dh over dt is negative. The instantaneous slope will be negative at that point. That is what you are guaranteed. Okay. You are not guaranteed that the gas by any means satisfies the um, assumption of molecular chaos at all times. There are fluctuations of course. Okay. Now, the h function also tells you something about those fluctuations. So we will discuss that. But before that, let me remind you of what equilibrium meant. What was the meaning of equilibrium? We discovered that equilibrium distribution of course means that this quantity must be 0. There is no explicit time dependence. So that was achieved by saying that if f of r v2 prime, so let me write it out. If this quantity v2 and it is an equilibrium distribution, so 
the time derivative is 0, that means this whole thing on the right hand side, if it is independent of r or even if it is dependent on, on, on it, even if there is an external force, we do not care. It put a specific condition on when the gas is in equilibrium and the condition was that in the state of thermal equilibrium, the distribution was such that this bracket vanished identically. Okay. So essentially we had a statement that F2 prime, F1 prime was equal to F1, F2, uh, F2, F1, does not matter what order you put it in. Okay. Where 1, 2 and 1 prime, 2 prime are related by this scattering geometry in this fashion. Okay. Now what does it remind you of? This thing if you like for the 2 particle system is like an initial state, that is like a final state. So it is really saying that if you give me a V1, then all those V2s such that this condition is satisfied on this side, the a priori probability of being having V1 is represented by F1. This is what causes a transition to the final state because it comes and scatters. And on the right hand side, this would have been the a priori probability and that is the scattering, what causes the scattering. So it is rem very reminiscent of what is happening in the theory of Markov processes where you have the assumption of detailed balance in a Markov chain. So if you recall when you write a master equation for a Markov chain, if you have states which are labeled by i, j, k, etc., etc., in a Markov chain, and you say that p sub i is the a priori probability that the system is in the state i, then p i multiplied by the transition probability for i to go to some j and that is equal to w j i. If this is equal to on this side w i j p j then you have the condition of detail balance and you have an equilibrium distribution. Of course, this is a sufficient condition for you to have uh, an equilibrium distribution because the Markov e uh, master equation says dp over dt, if I write all these p's as a column vector, is given on the right hand side by some capital W, some matrix, transition matrix times p and the elements of it are given by these transition rates. So, since this appears inside the summation, if each term in the sum is 0, then of course the whole thing is the sum is 0 and you have a stationary distribution. Okay. So this assumption is called detailed balance. Because each pair of states satisfies this condition here. And there is no reason why that should be the case for equilibrium. But if it is so, then this state, then you have an equilibrium distribution. So that is what is happening here. This is like a detailed balance condition. condition. And now in this situation, in this physical system, this dilute gas, what the Boltzmann equation, what Boltzmann's proof of necessary and sufficient condition for equilibrium being this says is that you automatically have detailed balance that as t tends to infinity any distribution you start with will tend to a unique equilibrium distribution which satisfies detail, this detailed balance condition. So there now, there is no Markov chain here. There is no, no Markov chain here. There is no such thing here. But it is detailed balance all the same. So it says, so it is what is trying, telling us of course is that uh, why did this come about? Where did this factor, these factors come from? They came from the scattering process. So as long as the scattering is time reversal invariant, as long as the dynamics is time reversal invariant, you are going to have this situation always. Huh? So that is really what it is telling us, saying something about time reversal, that it is a time reversal invariant system for these binary and of course the binary collision assumption. So uh, if you recall how did, uh, what did Boltzmann do to prove a necessary and sufficient condition? Well, we went through this proof, we said first, first of all, if it's uh, if this distribution in equilibrium is independent, if there's no external force, this part is zero. It's uniform distribution. This part is zero. Uh, 
and then the fact that you have an equilibrium distribution means that this must vanish and that vanishes implies that this integral must vanish here and a sufficient condition for the integral to vanish is for the integrand to vanish. That was the first part of the proof. The second part of the proof showed that it was also necessary by saying that what appears in the H function was the, the Boltzmann H function. By the way, the H is not the Hamiltonian, it's, it's closely related to the entropy. Um, Boltzmann actually used the letter E and then later on somebody else changed it to H. So it shouldn't be confused with the Hamiltonian. This function was for any distribution whatsoever, doesn't have to be a distribution which satisfies the Boltzmann equation at all. You define an H of T to be equal to integral d3 V f of V T log f of V T. That is the definition of the H function. So Pardon me? Pa he did not put the minus sign. It is left like this. Now we have to see where the minus sign comes in when we write the entropy of an ideal gas or entropy of a gas in equilibrium. So this immediately led to the conclusion that dh over trivially that this is equal to integral d3v delta f over delta t times 1 plus log f of v. And now the statement was that if this vanishes, if you have an equilibrium distribution, there is no time dependence, then this vanishes, okay. And the vanishing of this is a necessary condition because if this were not 0, there is no way this can be 0. It would have to be finite clearly. So the necessary condition for an equilibrium distribution is that this should vanish. And now put in for delta f over delta t, if you put in this whole thing here, then using the inequality about y minus x log x over y is always negative, no, non-positive, we discovered that you had to have this condition, the detail balance condition for an equilibrium. So it was necessary and sufficient in that case. So that much was the argument, okay. So the part that is ingenious was the fact that Boltzmann used the invariances of this object that if you interchange V1 and V2 after you integrate over V1, if you interchange V1, V2, nothing happens. If you interchange, this does not change at all. If you interchange the initial and final states, nothing happens except a change of sign here. So that gave us what was needed to show that the detail balance condition uniquely specifies the equilibrium distribution. Okay. Now given that much, we could ask what does this H function actually look like? Is it always, is if I plot this H function, what happens to it? After all, the system, even if it is momentarily in equilibrium, in other words, even if the distribution is, let me call that F equilibrium of V, the equilibrium time independent distribution, which satisfies the detail balance condition. If you say that this system is momentarily in this state, it does not remain so because collisions knock it out of that state instantaneously practically, right. So the system is always getting knocked out of equilibrium but it is being restored. The equilibrium is in some sense overall there is an equilibrium, right. So this is how statistical mechanics, the same molecular fluctuations or collisions that knock you out momentarily out of a state of equilibrium also help to restore this equilibrium. There are connections between fluctuation and dissipation which help you to restore this, right. So there is an pro interesting proof which tells you that if momentarily the system is, if you plot this H of T versus T and momentarily it is at a value here, then if the system obeys the assumption of molecular chaos, if F of V comma T at this instant of time satisfies the assumption of molecular chaos, then you are guaranteed that the H function will decrease. The local slope will be negative. That is all you are guaranteed, okay. But there is an interesting argument due to Francis Lowe which also says that when the system is in, when in this state 
molecular chaos assumption is valid in this state, momentarily it comes down, right. But the argument is that if you now reverse all the velocities in this state at this point, you are still in a state of molecular chaos, nothing changes. That has something to do with correlation between pairs of particles and that is independent of whether the particles have positive velocities or negative or whatever, have the velocities completely reversed or not, it does not matter. But then it also implies for that gas too with all the velocities reversed, you still have this negative slope. But the future of that reversed gas is the past of the present gas. So that in a few lines you can show that at this point if in the next instant you were going to have molecular chaos, the slope would have had to be positive, okay. There is a delicate argument here, it involves actually implementing the time reversal organ, uh, uh, operation, but in loose words what it means is exactly what I said that if you are in a state of molecular chaos at any instant of time, then at that instant of time the H function is at a local peak, but the function itself is fluctuating. So it is going zigzag, zigzag in this fashion. What you are guaranteed and there is nothing which says that this must function must have a continuous slope, does not say that at all. So the slope can and does jump dis discontinuously although the function is continuous. It all it says is these points at local peaks you have molecular chaos at these points. It does not even say that all local peaks must be states of molecular chaos. It only says if you have a state of molecular chaos, you have to be at a local peak. That is all it says. Okay. But there are fluctuations about it and what statistical mechanics does is precisely to calculate what these fluctuations do at this point. Now so the other point is suppose you are in a rare state, you prepare the system in a rare state, it will relax back to this state and what it will do is if you are in a state like this, which is far away and H is itself actually fluctuating like this, but then it finds itself there, then it will come down, it will relax back and go back, but it will do so in this fashion. And it will fluctuate back into this little range in which the system is approximately got an equilibrium distribution differs from it infinitesimally, but there are always local fluctuations. Okay. So it is not that the system is always in a state of thermal equilibrium, even if you are in thermal equilibrium on the average. So this H function, the Boltzmann equation is that solid curve, is a continuous curve there, is the smooth curve here. So it is an giving you something which is an average already hmm? and there are fluctuations about it. And you need these fluctuations. For instance, you know that uh, the, the sky is blue because of molecular scattering. It is scat happening because of local density fluctuations. If you did not have those density fluctuations, you would not have the sky colored blue at all. So this uh, scattering especially during uh, and this becomes very, very, uh, these fluctuations become very pronounced near critical points which is what we are going to study next and that is where you get phenomena like uh, critical scattering, critical opalescence, etc. So the scattering can become enormous in the, those situations. But even in the ordinary atmosphere, the fact that the sky is blue is due to density, scattering of light due to density fluctuations. So they are always happening all around you and you can measure them, there are measurable consequences, etc. But the fact is that the equilibrium is a statistical state. It is not as if the system is always in state. Now the H theorem says a little more also, one could ask what is the connection between that and a thermal equilibrium, uh, entropy in the thermal equilibrium state. Well, when F is equal to F equilibrium of V in that state, then this H is equal to minus the entropy divided by in the units is used V times K Boltzmann. We define this F, uh, F log F without putting in a Boltzmann constant there, but entropy has uh, measured in units of Boltzmann's constant. So 
this is the relation. And the V, because of the way we define this, our normalization is uh, integral D3 V F is equal to N, the number density, number per unit volume. So this is what the connection is. Okay. And the minus sign, as uh, Suresh pointed out, was because Boltzmann originally defined this H function with F log. So I hope this uh, kind of uh, tells you what the role of this H function is because we are now going to go on and see what we can do with this Boltzmann equation whether we can try to solve it or whether we can try to extract something from it, etc. First, let us look at how constants come out, how various uh, conservation laws come out. You know that in uh, um, mechanics, in dynamical systems, valid not just in particle mechanics but also in uh, theory of fields as well as quantum mechanics and quantum fields, etc. When you have continuous symmetries, you have associated with them certain invariances of the equations of motion and then you have conservation principles which are like equations of continuity and when you integrate them you get conservation laws, okay. Now where does that kind of thing appear here? Well, look at the following, keep that equation since we need it, go back to the way we derived the sufficient necessary condition from the Boltzmann equation for the equilibrium distribution. The maneuvering was that you integrate this over V1 and then you interchange v1 and v2, interchange initial state with the final state and interchange v2 prime with v1 prime. And you get several averages and we argued that all these follows uh, the same quantity and we took one fourth the whole lot, etc. Okay. Similar kind of thing goes on here because now let us suppose that you have the Boltzmann equation. You, uh, by the way, one small side remark. This quantity here, when we have an external potential, when this f was minus the gradient of some potential. I do not know what symbol I used here, phi, phi of r when you have a conservative force. Then this was the term that appeared in the Boltzmann equation, the, in the derivative term on the left hand side. Okay. Now you could ask what happens if I have a magnetic field? Then you have a velocity dependent potential and can we now do this? Can we extend this formalism to it? The answer is yes. For the simple reason that uh, if you compute del V dot V cross B, this quantity is what appears ultimately, it is 0, okay. It is identically 0. If you differentiate with respect to the components of V, this quantity here, it is immediately obvious that this quantity is 0 because we write this as uh, del i with respect to v. So del uh, delta v i uh, epsilon i j k v j v j b k, okay. And of course, uh, the derivative of this fellow with respect to delta v i is uh, chronic delta i j and that contracts with this and gives you 0. Okay. So this formalism trivially extends to the case of a magnetic field. Even though there is a velocity dependent force, it does not matter. You can still write it this way. Now uh, what we would like to do is to derive. Yeah, exactly. So what we are going, exactly. So what we are going to do is to write, uh, there is no energy that is gained by, there is no, the there is no work done by a magnetic field on a charged particle, okay. Now what we are going to do is to see where conservation laws come from, okay. So let us look at the following. Let us write, uh, I need a symbol for this whole mess, what shall I call it. Let me call capital phi of R and T equal to an integral over D3 and because I have always got V1 sitting here, this is V1, V1, etc. This is V1, okay. So let me call this V1. Some function, uh, little phi of V1 times F of R V1. Let me define. Okay. It is like a moment of this distribution. 
with respect to the v variable. If I put phi equal to 1 or v or v squared, v cubed, etc., I get the moments of this distribution, but it could be an arbitrary function of e. Understand? Okay. If I plug that in here, multiply both sides by little phi of v1 and integrate over all values of v1, okay, what happens? So let us do d3 v1 phi of v1 f of uh, r v1 t this guy here and the first term well we can write down the first term directly it is delta over delta t phi of r and t that is this term okay, okay. plus what should I write? Think of what is the most notationally the simplest way to do this without messing around. Let us just write it out and see where it gets us. I can certainly pull this fellow out, that is true, but I want to be a little cautious. I want to be a little cautious. Well, bear with me for a minute. I want to be a little cautious. I do not want to. So, phi of V1 right here, and then uh, F over M, assuming this to be a function of R alone dot gradient v1 f understand hmm? equal to well this part is okay but equal to on this side we have d3 v1 d3 v2 d sigma oh, let me just forget about this stuff for a moment d sigma and then uh, phi of v1 u and all the rest of it on this side, okay. Now let us come to terms with what is going on here. In the absence of an external force, hmm, this is 0, no external force. Implies this is 0 there is no f. Okay. So, you have this plus this term here. Now, what does this term look like? It says phi of v1 is sitting here and then there is a v1. I want to simplify this term. So, I want to be able to write well <laughs> this term here is gradient r dot gra well messing around with the notation. I want to write this as a current. Integral d3 v1 phi of v1 v1 times f this quantity here is a vector quantity hmm? and the v1 goes away. Agree? So, let me call this equal to j some current density related to this function. So, let me put it as j phi and it is a function of r and t. Okay. And am I right in calling this del dot j? I mean I can write this as grad, uh, grad, grad f dot v1, right and bring the gradient all the way out of the integral. 
I put this as V1 and then take this grad outside because it has nothing to do with the integral and this quantity I call J whatever it is. All right. Okay. So I am getting an equation which says this plus grad r dot j which is related to the function phi r t equal to something on the right hand side. Huh? But look at what happens on the right hand side. Huh? There is a phi of v1 here, but I know that if I interchange v1 and v2, the rest of it does not change. I can interchange variables of integration. This becomes phi of v2, but u does not change because it is mod v2 minus v1. So let us keep that in our mind. This quantity on the right hand side is the same if you put a phi of v2 here. So I can add the 2 and take the average. Hmm? Then I will interchange the initial and final conditions. This fellow is going to become v1 prime and this is d3 v1 prime v2 prime but in that process I can now change variables of integration because d3 v1 d3 v2 is equal to d3 v1 prime d3 v2 prime exactly as we did for the Boltzmann uh, for the H theorem. But this becomes phi of v1 prime and this term here becomes f2 f1 minus f2 prime f1 prime so there is a minus sign and then I interchange v2 prime and v1 prime so once again I get phi of v2 prime out here with a minus sign. So on the right hand side this quantity now we are in good shape this quantity is equal to an integral 1 fourth because I took 4 of these fellows here 1 fourth d3 v1 integral d3 v2 uh, times integral d sigma uh, d, d sigma which is a function of this uh, wherever you are and u times u that is also sitting there times times f2 prime f1 prime minus f2 f1 times the following phi of v1 plus phi of v2 minus phi of v1 prime minus phi of v2 prime okay. because all this remained invariant including this and this fellow changed sign when I interchange the initial and final states I have taken that into account here and I have added up all four ways of writing the right hand side and divided by 4. So this is an exact equation. where this current was defined as d3 v or v1 we do not care phi of v okay, uh, times f of r v and t. So this is identically equal to that. This looks like a conservation law if the right hand side was 0. So now the argument is if this function phi of v is a function such that this quantity is identically 0 in a scattering process then you have a conservation law automatically. Right? So now you turn it around and say if phi of v is such that phi of uh, v1 plus phi of v2 is equal to phi of v1 prime plus phi of v2 prime then 
delta capital phi of R t over delta t plus the divergence with respect to R, the usual divergence of J phi of R t equal to 0. That is an equation of continuity. Now we list all the quantities that are invariant and in this scattering, okay. What is the simplest quanti quantity that you can think of that is unchanged in scattering? Well, phi, phi equal to constant. I mean if I put phi equal to 1, right, that is a constant, that is a good question. 1 plus 1 is equal to 1 plus 1, clear, right. So that is certainly a constant of the motion. This is a trivial constant of the motion. What is it going to conserve? Well, if phi equal to 1, phi of, uh, if phi of v, yeah, if phi of v is equal to 1, then the corresponding phi of Rt equal to integral d3 v1 times f of R v1 t and that is equal to the number density at the point r at time t. Okay. So our first conservation principle is the conservation of number, of mass if you like, of matter. Right. So this is immediately going to tell us delta n over delta t is a function of r and t. If there is a local density fluctuation, then there has got to be a flux of particles across, right. This is equal to plus del dot j of r t equal to 0, where this j of r t is equal to and now all we got to do is to plug in the formula for what this j was. If you recall, this quantity was equal to integral d3 v, right, times what? What did we have? We had a v, definitely we had a v and then what else? And then an f. We had a phi is 1 in this case, phi is 1. Okay. So we had a phi of v and then an f, right, and there was just a v and that is it. What is this representative of? We have been careless a little bit about putting in dimensional quantities like mass and so on. We should be a little careful. But it's it's okay as it stands. What does it uh, what does it represent? This is the momentum current. Apart from a factor of n, this is the momentum current. So this is the usual continuity equation for matter. In the usual hydrodynamic language, the current is rho times v, the density times the velocity. And that is exactly what you have here. Density, so that is the equation of continuity for number density. Okay. What happens if you put phi equal to the energy? Incidentally, there is one more thing that is conserved. I never said that phi has to be a scalar. It did not have to be a scalar. I got to be a little more careful about how I manipulate these vector symbols. But phi could have been a set of three quantities, a vector components of a vector. V itself, because I know that in a collision process, I know that in this process, if since it is equal masses, V1 plus V2 equal to V1 prime plus V2 prime, component for component, right. So certainly that is going to be again a conservation principle here. 
right. And what are we going to, so we put phi of v equal to v itself and in deference to notation let us put a vector there. Hmm? Then this fellow is a vector out here and it is equal to v. So this is the momentum if you like and each component of it satisfies a continuity equation. On the right hand side, this j would now become a two index object because for each component, each of the components of phi you are going to get since you are going to integrate with the phi here, there is going to be a vi, vj on the right hand side. So you are roughly going to get something like delta over delta t. Now fix these factors, I have not looked at it carefully enough. So, d 3 v f of uh, r v t v i any index i is going to plus this is going to look like some del i some current j i j equal to 0 where this thing is going to involve an integral d3 v, v i v j f of r v t. Apart from some factors, this is the kinetic part of the so called stress tensor. Okay. What happens if I put phi of v equal to half mv squared? That is the energy, right. Then there is going to be an energy flux density on this side. So I leave you to write down that equation. So there are basically five conservation rules that we can write down immediately. Phi of v equal to 1 for the number, then phi of v equal to v that gives you 3 more for the momentum current and then you have for the kinetic energy 1 more. So the choices are phi of v equal to 1, phi of v a vector equal to v itself and phi of v equal to half m v squared okay. and they will give you the corresponding current uh, continuity equations. From those continuity equations you can extract the transport coefficients such as the diffusion coefficient, viscosity, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity etc. If it is charged then electrical conductivity and so on. And then you put a magnetic field you can construct the Hall conductivity. Okay. So the business of kinetic uh, theory is to compute all these transport coefficients and they would follow from several conservation principles in this fashion. Now let us turn to what happens to the Boltzmann equation itself and I would like to make, uh, I would like to complete this. So I would like to make some comments on this uh, on the on the solution of the Boltzmann equation in the simplest case. So let me schematically explain how this is done or maybe defer this till tomorrow since I have already run out of time. Uh, basically the point is let me just say it in words. The point is that you have an equation for this quantity f of r v t which is nonlinear an integral differential equation and you assume a small deviation from equilibrium. So you write this as basically equal to F equilibrium of V which satisfies detail balance hmm, plus a correction, a small correction which tells you how far away from equilibrium you are in the distribution sense. So you write plus a G of R. Now put this into the Boltzmann equation. This portion of course the delta over delta t does not act on it at all. The left hand side is 0 for this portion. This portion will be acted on on the left hand side and on the right hand side you are going to have a product of 4 of these guys 2 at a time and a difference. So you write this for V1, V2, V1 prime, V2 prime and then take f2 prime f1 prime minus f2 f1 
the term which is 0th order in G will cancel out by detail bounds because that is the definition of the equilibrium part and what will be left will be combinations of F's 1 F equilibrium with a G with a different index. Then you put in delta functions in V to take out a G common with some given uh, variable and then delta functions to fix what the actual velocity argument is for each of these and then you try to solve that linearized Boltzmann equation. So you throw away terms like G squared. You throw away terms like G squared. Now if you want a systematic approximation scheme then you would have to keep systematically the second order, higher order, etc. But the linear term itself is hard enough and what I will do tomorrow is uh, take the time to actually write this expression out and then we will see how to extract uh, transport coefficient from it. In particular, we would like to see if we can touch base with what we did earlier with the Langevin equation for diffusion for instance. We had a formula for the diffusion constant in terms of the friction constant, temperature, etc. We would like to see if how that comes out or if at all it does from the Boltzmann equation. We also had a Fokker-Planck equation for the velocity, conditional velocity. Now there we made assumptions about the mass of that particle, Brownian particle being much bigger than the rest of it, the molecular mass. We have made no such assumption here. In fact, we are talking about elastic collisions here. So we would like to see how this differs from that and what happens. And what happens in the simplest approximation? We linearize the Boltzmann equation and make a lot of simplifying assumptions essentially saying there is no positional dependence, everything is uniform distribution in space and only the velocity is distributed and let us see what it does, what it gives us. So we will go through that.